Welcome to St. David's. Uh, so glad that you could join us this morning for our second Sunday in Advent. Uh, everything is right here in your bulletin. We even have the music now in the bulletin. Um, you might notice that some of the service music has changed slightly, so you have to pay a little closer attention. Um, for those of you join, who are joining us online, we're happy that you are joining us as well. You can find the bulletin on the front page of our website, stdavids.net. Um, another thing is that you might see some cards in front of your pew back in front of you. If you have not yet updated your info, uh, we would love for you to do that so that we can, we can keep our records updated. Um, and uh, we invite you to stand as we sing together our opening hymn. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. sent your messengers, the prophets, to preach repentance and prepare the way for our salvation. Give us grace to heed their warnings and forsake our sins, that we may greet with joy the coming of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the readings. reading from the book of Malachi. 
See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, indeed he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the descendants of Levi, and refine them, refine them like gold and silver, until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord, as in the days of old and as in former years. The word of the Lord. Let us read the song of Zechariah together in unison. Blessed be the glory of God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets he promised the Lord that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins and the tender compassion of our God. The dawn from on high shall break upon us to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. A reading from Paul's letter to the Philippians. I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you, because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this way about all of you, because you hold me in your heart. For all of you share in God's grace with me, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I long for all of you with the compassion of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you to determine what is best so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. The word of the Lord.
Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. In the fifteenth year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip ruler of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. The Gospel of the Lord. of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. December of 1877, Thomas Edison filed a patent for the phonograph. It's a big deal. I mean, Edison probably had no clue at the time what impact this would have. The, the ability to record and to play back audio, I mean, had a pretty big impact. Edison improved his machine so that this product was a little wax cylinder that would send the audio out of this big horn on top. He eventually created a company to market and to sell these phonographs, but of course competition crept in, others making a few changes to the design to sell these brand new music making machines. The primary competitor uh, was the Victor Talking Machine Company, who developed uh, a version of the gramophone, you know, making some changes. They put the horn inside a piece of furniture, and they used flat discs instead of wax cylinders. And Victor put out the product called the Victrola. And there were a few distinct advantages with the Victrola, you know, that it was packaged in a nice piece of furniture. I mean, that was pretty, right? Um, also, flat discs were easier to store than those canned cylinders. But Edison challenged this with a desire to make the best audio quality possible. He thought if he just made a superior product that would firmly establish his music player on top. The Victor Company, they decided to prioritize something else, marketing. They sank way more money into advertisements. They promoted famous musicians, you know, had celebrity endorsements. Edison's response to this was, we care nothing for the reputation of the artists, singers, or instrumentalists. He said, all that we desire is that the voice shall be as perfect as possible. So while Edison is perfecting the technology, Victrola is busy making print ads, telling as many people as possible about their product. They bought a painting of a dog listening to a gramophone horn, an offer that Edison had turned down, and this image eventually became the logo for RCA. The result was that Victrola sales went through the roof. Edison started catching so much grief from his dealers that even he had to create a line with flat disks as well. Dealers of Edison's machines also complained that the print material they had was incredibly boring. Victor catalogs, they had pictures and biographies of artists, while Edison's catalogs were simply typed lists of their records in alphabetical order. 
even though Edison had a better product, more superior technology, he failed. He didn't understand the importance of telling the story. He thought that he could just put his head down and concentrate on building the perfect machine and that people would just beat a path to his door, that they would flock to this better product. Instead, the power of word, the power of story, the benefit of artists using their platforms, this dual focus on product, but also what people need to hear, that made the Victor company far more successful. They eventually merged to become RCA Victor, and that dog listening to the gramophone became a universally recognizable symbol. And RCA became a household brand name for a long time. Luke 3 begins with a list of names. Typically, we're going to skim through lists of names in Scripture, right? Because they're just boring, let's be honest. We're going to get to the good parts, the miracles. But this list is actually pretty important to Luke's message. We don't hear a list of ancestors like other parts of the Bible, you know, so-and-so begets, so-and-so begets, so-and-so. No, these names situate the story in a particular time. It doesn't really have so much to do with historical placement, you know, making sure we have our timelines correct. But really, we're told of the rulers who were in place. Who has voice? Who has authority? Luke mentions Emperor Tiberius, the governor Pontius Pilate, the reign of Herod, other rulers in the region allowed to have power by Rome. And Luke, here in the beginning of the story, wants to, he, he makes an effort to, to situate this story in a time of Roman occupation. The empire casts this big shadow over everything, and this detail has a resounding impact on all that's going to come after it, the whole rest of the story. There was an emperor, a pervading presence. The emperor was in charge, and they had a big voice. And it's here where we're introduced to this new thing that's happening. The word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Luke shows John as the messenger, quoting from Isaiah, the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness. The one who proclaims the nearness of God's rescue, the salvation of God's people, a return from those wandering from home. It's ultimately a message of peace after long hardship. He proclaims, all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Luke places these two, the empire and John, side by side for comparison. We use the term gospel a lot. You know, Christians refer to the four books detailing Jesus' life as the gospels. I just read from our gospel book. We talk about preaching the gospel. And we get it from this word evangelion, which means good tidings or good news. But Jesus wasn't the first to use this term. Our, our, our writers in the Bible are not the first to use this term. Evangelion had been language that had been used by the Roman Empire. There's actually a stone inscription that still exists. It talks about Caesar Augustus, Tiberius's predecessor, and it says, the birthday of the god Augustus was the beginning of the good tidings of the world. This inscri inscription says uh, about Augustus, he might benefit humankind being sent as a savior that he might end war and arrange all things. All that language sounds pretty familiar. I mean, this is the time of year that we remember the beginning of the good news. We sing songs about good tidings. Remember the Savior of the world coming into being, the birthday of the one who is to come. In a time where the empire suggested the good news was the peace that Rome brought through sword and through oppression and violence. In the middle of that, a new way emerged. The proclamation of a prophet pointed to a different good news. 
another gospel that would rescue God's people. John appears as a prophet signaling a different way. Before hearing about miracles or all the incredible things that Jesus does, Luke tells us about John, a person like you and me, proclaiming another kind of good news, a true and abiding peace. This peace doesn't look like the peace that Rome will bring. John proclaims things like forgiveness and mercy and justice. As a prophet, he is tasked with speaking up, speaking up for this other way, using his voice to signal this other good news that is to come. In Advent, we ready ourselves for the coming of the Messiah. Remembering John the Baptist does more than just begin the story for us. It lays out a calling. It serves as a reminder that we all are called to be prophets. All of us. All Christians are to be proclaimers of the good news, to be herald of good tidings, to signal the peace that is found in Christ. But so many things compete in this space claim to offer the same thing. They claim to offer comfort and peace. Empires and earthly propaganda, they try to offer us a version of the good news. We're not only invited to join the way of Christ, but to be messengers, to use our voice as one in the wilderness, to proclaim real peace. We are to preach the gospel of peace, and not just from pulpits, but in our lives, in our Monday to Saturday lives. There's a quote attributed to St. Francis of Assisi that has been kind of put up on a pedestal, uh, especially by people like us Episcopalians. It says, preach the gospel always, and if necessary, use words. This short phrase has all the hallmarks of like a really great motto. It's short, so it can be easily memorized. It mirrors common wisdom, you know, kind of, uh, you know, action speaks louder than words. So it has a sort of timelessness to it. It's attributed to one of our favorite saints, St. Francis. But more than anything, the popularity of this adage comes down to one thing. It's a great out. It's a really great excuse. And like, we don't want to say anything. We would prefer to quietly live out our personal spirituality in our own little bubbles, like good little Episcopalians, dignified and proper. But speaking up is important. Telling the story is a vital component. Refusing to speak gives ground to the imitation, the inferior product. Edison had a much better product, but he didn't recognize the importance of telling the message. He gave space for others to come in. Others have papered the world offering fraudulent peace, offering a sort of watered-down version of the good news, a gospel maybe that needs fierce defending, a good news that requires force. Now, please don't hear me suggesting, like, a a new marketing strategy for church growth. It's not kind of an each one, reach one challenge. And this is also not a recommendation that we should be defensive or combative with people of other religious backgrounds. It's just the opposite. The real competition to this good news is the alteration of real peace. The idea that peace first requires conflict. John the Baptist becomes the first messenger, making way for a savior, who comes not with majesty and a big stick, but comes in great humility. He paves a way for that gospel, a gospel of forgiveness, for the salvation for all. You know, we regularly pray that we might have eyes to see or ears to hear, but we rarely ask for tongues to speak. You are to be messengers of substantive peace in an atmosphere of hostility and fear. Speak harmony 
even though others try to sell you strife. Prepare the way of the Lord by using your voice to bring peace. Amen. Standing together, let us firm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally God the Father, God and God, life and life, true God and true God, the God and not made, of the one in being of the Father, through whom all things were made, for us and for our salvation, He came out from heaven, by the power of the Holy Spirit, He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary, and was made. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory to, in the world. Lord, in your mercy, guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others, and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, guide the minds of those who shall choose a head of school, that we may receive a faithful leader who will care for your children and teach them to love whatever is just and true and good. Lord, in your mercy. Bless all those whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy. Comfort and heal Blake, Max and Gray, Andrew, Frank, Brennan, Tim and Beck, Peggy, Bill, Alice, Colleen, Betty, John, Robert, Edward and Susan, Joe and Haiti, Bayless, Dee Dee, Bob, Charlotte, Olivia, and all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy. We commend to your mercy all who have died, especially Ruth, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I give to you, my own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign now and forever. Amen.
Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you. If God were Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins, through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Good morning. I invite you to turn to your announcements. Uh, we have a lot going on. I'll try to make this quick. Uh, first, today we're having our blood drive, um, and I think there might be some spots still open if any of you uh, are, are willing and able to get blood today. Um, you can go back and, and they'll get you hooked up. Um, it, it is just this tremendous opportunity to give in this season of giving, so thank you for all of you who, who have given blood. Hopefully you had like a cookie or some orange juice or something. Um, we also, uh, every year we give a gift to all the students at Wilshire, um, and typically all of you have, have gone out and purchased the gift, like uh, we've done board games in the past, last year I think we did pajamas. Um, this year they've asked that we give sweatshirts, um, and so th these are not things that you're going out and purchasing, we've already purchased them, but we would ask that you help support this cause. So we're giving 251 shirts away, so we need, we need all of your help. So you, each shirt is $13 a person, so uh, if you give, if you write a check, you can write St. David's and write sweatshirts in the memo, or uh, you can do that on our Tithely uh, app or on our website as well. Um, we also give good sandbags every year, um, and a lot of you have already been great at providing either money for that or, or bringing in the, the bags themselves. Tomorrow is the last day for that, so if, if you have been planning on, on doing good sandbags, please bring those to the office uh, by tomorrow the 6th. Um, this is a kind of a busy season where we have holiday parties and uh, you know all of that stuff has come roaring back. And so the Daughters of the King are offering to, to everyone, not just the Daughters of the King in our congregation, an opportunity for kind of silent meditation and prayer. So on Friday, uh, we will be gathering together at the Bishop Jones Center. If you're interested in that, uh, we invite you to come for, for this time of, of prayer. Um, we also have fundraisers going on for our youth group and for Bright Beginnings. So please uh, ask that you support those two important ministries. Um, and then really important is that we're having Campus Beautification Day. Um, we will be decorating the inside of the church. Um, we need help with that. Uh, we'll also be kind of maintaining some of our, our uh, campus as well um, as we get ready to invite a whole bunch of uh, people for Christmas. Uh, so please, if you're able to join us on the 12th at 2.30, it allows you to get home, get changed, have a bite to eat, and then come back. Uh, so next week. Um, we have our Christmas pageant on the 19th, and Mary Hayden needs plenty of help. So if, if you have kids that want to be in the play, uh, we have many roles that need to be filled, but we also need people to help gather and shepherd as well. So uh, please talk to Mary Hayden if you're able to help with that. Um, Young at Heart is a group for the seniors in our congregation, um, and they are returning in January with their first. They have uh, a luncheon once a month with a lecture. Um, and so uh, if you are interested in that, you can talk to James Wilcox or, or Donald Sylvester. 
think that's all. We do have a gap group today following the service uh, for those who are between the, the grade third and fifth grade. So uh, they'll be getting together after the service. Do we have any uh, birthdays or anniversaries to celebrate this morning? that this couple, having taken each other in marriage and affirming again the covenant which they have made, may grow in forgiveness, and loyalty, and love, and come at last to the eternal joys which you have promised through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Happy anniversary. Let's pray for our birthdays. Watch over your children, O Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they stand. Comfort them when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise them up if they fall, and in their hearts may your peace, which passes understanding, abide all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Happy birthday. Ascribe to the Lord the honor due his name, bring offerings, and come into his courts.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, because you sent your beloved Son to redeem us from sin and death, and to make us heirs in him of everlasting life, that when he shall come again in power and great triumph to judge the world, we may without shame or fear rejoice to behold his appearing. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death to life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming to the Lord, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son and his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country, for with David and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from
gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honored and glory, now and forever. Amen. May the sun of righteousness shine upon you and scatter the darkness from before your path. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you now and remain with you always. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.